Good morning. Glad you all are here. In spite of bad backs and everything else. This morning's lesson is entitled, Heavenly Investments. The text for it comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Verse 19, beginning, it says, Lay not up for your treasures of Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lie of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body then uh, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking, uh, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things shall be, these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So with the foundational belief that all the material universe will one day come to, uh, come, one day be destroyed by fire, how ought we to live? It's all going to go away. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker some years back that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Well, that's not true. Because when you die, all that goes, somebody's going to get it. Doesn't matter what you, what you acquired and so forth. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know, there's, there's a contrast here between the material universe and how we ought to behave. And which one of those things, which one of the two groups is going to last. It's a very crucial thing to think about. Now, since we're going to be judged on deeds, what ought, what ought sort of activities, what's, <laughs> what sort of activities ought we to engage in? Whew, that was tough. I even have it written down. Acts chapter 10, Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation... He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we're going to be judged on the things we do. We're going to be judged by the standard of God's word. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said the words that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. So that being the case, it it just seems to me more than just passably important that we know what the Bible says. John records, and I saw a great, in the Revelation letter, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There's 2 Peter 3, 10, 11, or 9 and 10 for you. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. 
Now, that sounds like a pretty big deal to me. I, all, most all of us here have burnt themselves in one thing or another. If you live in the Mississippi Delta and got a hold of your car handle in August, you've burnt yourself. That's just the way it is. So we all understand that kind of a pain. They say that a burn is probably one of the most uh, painful injuries that one can suffer. You imagine being burned all over for an eternity and not being destroyed. You know, you put your hand on a burner and turn that burner on on a stove and eventually your hand's going to stop being able to feel anything. But your body in hell will continue on. That's a scary thought. And yes, I want to scare people with hell. I, well, you're trying to scare them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No question about that. God has always had a standard of behavior with which man was to comply. There's never been a time with man on the earth that he wasn't governed by some law or another. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. They were told to dress and keep it. And of every fruit of the tree, of any, of any fruit of any tree in the garden they could eat, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As far as other, other than being fruitful and replenishing the earth and not eating of the tree of the, garden, of the knowledge of good and evil and dressing and keeping the garden, that seems to be what we have recorded, the limit of what they were responsible for doing and, and avoiding. Very, very simple law, and apparently they didn't keep it very well for very long. Abram had a particular law that he was to follow. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram. And said unto, him, said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. So the condition for being multiplied was to follow God's commandments and do what he said to do. So Abram had something he was supposed to do, and things he was supposed to avoid, I would say. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God, uh, Moses, just before he's carried away, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come to thee and overtake thee, if thou wilt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now, notice verse 15 to that same chapter. But, now he's already listed a boatload of blessings. Just wonderful stuff. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then he goes on to the end of that chapter, about 68 verses or 69 verses, and listing all of the curses that could befall them if they didn't toe the line. It didn't matter. I mean, it, it didn't matter. They didn't listen. Now, back in Leviticus chapter 28, excuse me, verse 20, chapter 26, I've got about four verses down here, and he's basically saying the same thing. But verse 18 says, And if you will not, for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 22, if you, And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary to me, then will I work, uh, walk contrary to you and punish you yet seven times for your sins. Seven in addition to. And he does that for the next, next two verses, verses 24 and 28. Hey, so, so he's telling them, now, and I, 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 I'm, I, I got caught my calculator out and calculated. Seven times seven times seven times seven. That's 16,807. And I got to thinking about that. That's not accurate. Because that first seven, he's listed about three or four or five different things he's going to curse him with. And he says he's going to increase it seven times more. So that would actually be 21, wouldn't it? So, so then, you look, then you look down at the next one. And he stacks some more stuff up, and I'll multiply that times seven. So those things, in addition to what's gone, times seven. So 16,807 doesn't even touch the hem of that garment. Now, I tell you, I'm not smart enough to figure out how many times that is. How, how much, I, I mean... But I'm thinking to myself, about halfway down, I'm going to break out in a sweat. And I'm thinking, we, need, we, we just need to be, somebody needs to be in charge of making sure we don't, we don't step off this cliff, because it's going to hurt really bad. Anyways, and, and read the rest of the Bible, read the rest of the Old Testament. Those folks, 
they just couldn't keep it on the road. They just ran that thing off in the ditch every chance they got. When Josiah the boy king finally passed away, it wasn't six months before they were back worshiping idols. They, you know, you stand there and look at the, I, you know, I used to drive up and down 82 going back and forth and I see all these fish ponds out there when we first got here. And, and then I guess it was the following year, I actually saw them out there harvesting the fish and I saw some guy putting on waders and I'm thinking he's going to get out in the middle of that pond, he's going to drown. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't waist deep all the way across. I was so disappointed. I thought that was just deep, 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 deep. And he didn't get hardly wet walking. Well, this is different. This is just, I mean, the Mississippi River, it, it's very, very wide, and it's very, very deep. So these people under the boy King Josiah didn't have a faith. It was more an inch deep or a mile wide because they went right back to worshiping idols after a number of years, they went right back to where they'd been before. Just amazing to me. And then since Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we've been a subject of the gospel of Christ. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God and the salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, dwell in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him walking in light as he is in light, 1 John 1. So we've all, all of mankind, by the way, is amenable, subject to the law of Christ. There's not anybody alive since the day of Pentecost or will yet be alive when Christ comes again that won't be subject to the law of Christ. Well, what about the people, and I'll let you fill in the blank. What about the people over here? What about the people back then? If it's been since the day of Pentecost, before, prior to Christ coming again, every man everywhere is subject to the gospel of Christ. Nobody's going to heaven that's not, since that time that has not obeyed the gospel of Christ. That's just the way it is. Then what about all those people? I know we need to get busy. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? So that's, that's a very, very important thing. But then we come to the investment strategy of all of this. The riches fade rapidly and certainly, verses 19 through 21. Doesn't matter what you have, especially with the inflation that's coming up. It's already here. I, I, I was watching a, a podcast last night, and the gas prices for a gallon of regular gas in, in California is $7.60 something cents a gallon. Hamburgers $10 a pound. A pound? And it's going to get worse. So, whatever it is you think you have, it's fixing to go away to some extent. And again, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, verse 9. Uh, uh, Verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, so God's will is that all come to repentance, and not all men will. Verse 14, he says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So there's going to come a time. And again, 2 Corinthians 5:10, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. To receive the things done to the body, whether good or bad, whether good or evil. So everybody is amenable. Everybody is subject. We all have a responsibility to behave as God expects us to behave. And we're held responsible. Well, I didn't know is not going to cut it on the day of judgment. You know, the thing is, is each of us, via, and the, the argument that Paul makes in Romans chapter 10 is that even the Gentiles that don't, didn't have the law of Moses still had a law of the conscience. They still knew that it was... If somebody lied to them, they'd be upset. Now, even a liar doesn't like somebody lying to him. Even a thief doesn't like somebody stealing from him. So everybody has a conscience that they violate. And, and because we've even sinned against ourselves, ultimately against, against God in the final analysis, but because we've sinned against ourselves, we're going to be lost. That's, that's, that's why those folks are going to be lost. Not because they never obeyed the gospel, but because they sinned and didn't obey the gospel but it's because they sinned first. Our values focus on, on eternal things. At least they ought to. Now, we all, need, we all need, you can't hardly get around without a car. If you don't have a car, then there's a, there's a fellow that rides around town on his bicycle. You see him all the way up and down. All the, I mean, he's, he's slowly, slowly. It takes him a while to get there, but he gets there. I've seen him over at Walmart and all up and down and everything, and, and, and don't get in his way. <laughs> it's just... It's just, just He's looking at the ground. He's not going to, don't get in his way. Just get out of the way, slow down, stop, let him go past. You'll be all right. But um, and, and everybody, if you don't have a car, you're going to call somebody. So I need, I need somebody. Would you take me down to wherever? And, of course, you know, folks do that for you, at least to some extent. 
But we all need certain amounts of money to, you know, keep things together. We need, need money to keep the power bills on and, and the water running and groceries on the table and all those things that goes along with that. We all understand that. So we, we, we have to have money. We, when we, so we need, we need material stuff. But it's, it's what really, and, and we love the things that we invest in. We're really concerned about, you know, if you've got money in a stock, stock account somewhere, a retirement account, you're concerned about that. You get those statements in, and you look at those statements, and you check them out and make sure everything's doing good. And when the number is positive, you think, oh, great. And when it's negative, you think, ah, oh, you're upset. And, and understandably so. Because that's what you've worked for. But Matthew 12 and verse 30. Jesus says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Well, if you're, if you're working in the Lord, you, if, if, you're, if you have your, your mind on things that are spiritual, you're going to be interested in what the Lord has to say. If you're indifferent about what the Lord has to say, then you're not interested in spiritual things. Now, that, now, some, some people, was it 1 Corinthians 14, 37, I think it is. Uh, I've heard people say, well, I think I'm a spiritual person. Well, I have an answer. That, I don't have an answer for that. Paul, Paul has an answer for that. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, well, I'm spiritual. I don't think I have to go to church. I'm a pretty spiritual person. Paul says, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Upon the first day of every week, let each of you lay by him in store, he says over in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, and, 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 and you get a lot of mealy, but humming, humming, humming about that particular point. People aren't that interested. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, you have a church in Laodicea that they thought they were rich. They thought they had a lot of stuff, and they did. I, I don't know what kind of church buildings they had back then. Apparently, they had some meeting places at this particular time. In history, they had some meeting places of one sort or another. And apparently they're fairly nice. Doing some reading on the book of Revelation, there seems to be some indication that, you know, congregations start having church buildings, meeting places to meet in. Um, but the Lord says, but you're, you're naked and you're blind and you're poor. Even though they, they showed up in nice cars, or nice cars, <laughs> and nice chariots, I don't know. They showed up nicely, dressed nicely, and, and all that kind of thing, and uh, but apparently they weren't. They weren't doing that well. And the Lord says, I wish that you were hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'm just going to spew you out of my mouth. But they weren't doing that good. God takes care of the birds and the flowers, and surely he's going to be mindful of us. Over in Matthew chapter 5, which is just across the page from our text, verse, um, verse 43, he says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So he's blessed us with the material universe that we can use to our benefit, that we can, quote unquote, exploit. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, down in Florida, if you... Well, I'm just going to use W.R. Grace, a big chemical company, chemical company in Mulberry, Florida. Uh, they had a big plant down there that processed phos uh, phosphate rock into phosphoric acid, which they use for various and sundry things. I think some of it's even used for fertilizer. But to get that stuff out of the ground, they had a, uh, uh, a, a steam shovel that was uh, a drag, we'll call it a drag line, that the bucket on the drag line was as big as this auditorium is, huge. And they would come down, and they'd scoop it up, and they'd pull it over here, and they'd put it into a slime pit, and they'd fill it full of water, and they'd pump it over to the, to the processing plant, and they'd process phosphoric acid of it. And, and they would start way down there, and they'd come back this way, and they'd hit that turn row, and they'd turn around, and they'd go back the other way. They'd just do that. And when they got done, it looked like a moonscape. I mean, just great big trenches well, as, as easily as deep as this building is high and deeper to get out the, phosphor, the phosphate rock. Now, that's exploiting the land. But you come back in about four or five years, and there's a cow pasture there with a number of bass lakes that had some serious bass in them. So, boy, if you like a bass fish, go down to Polk County, Florida. So they reclaimed the land. They, they, well, they reclaimed the land. 
They didn't, they, they exploited it, but they didn't abuse it because they restored it to a large degree even better than what it had been before because now it had a very, very practical use. It wasn't just a field out there someplace. So we have, a, we have this, this obligation, you know, God has given us this universe to take care of ourselves. And it's up to us to use it and then to use it properly. But this isn't all there is. You know, there's only so much money you can spend at any one time, I suppose. Solomon's glory does not compare with the joy and the satisfaction that Christians have. You know, uh, you think about all that he had, and then, then he had to turn around and give it to Rehoboam when he died. And when you say what Rehoboam did with it, he just totally messed it up. But spiritually, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of, man who, Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. Now, that's a pretty big deal. So we have a standard, something to guide ourselves by. Ephesians 4 and verse 24, and then you put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Colossians 3, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in, in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So there's a spiritual side to us that, that, that we need to be uh, uh, refurbishing, if you will. By following the gospel and doing what it says to do, becoming that, that new man. Romans chapter 6, uh, the dying, I, I'm crucified, uh, no, Romans 6, 1 and 2, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid, how shall we that live any longer therein, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein, for as many as us have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, and like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should rise to walk in newness of life. So we die to self. That's the, self, that's the crucifixion part of that thing. We die to self. That's repentance. And I put on Christ when I'm buried with him by baptism into his death. I, ha I bear the old man of sin, and I rise to walk in newness of life. And you can go on down in, in Romans chapter 6 there, down 7, 8, 9, and 10, and read how we've crucified the old man of sin and put him to death. And as a consequence... We need to be living differently. Again, Colossians 3 and verse 10, to put on the new man, what's renewed. Um, materially, J um, James chapter 4 and, and verse 3, um, James says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. You know, again, we need certain, we need certain material blessings. If we don't have them, the lights don't come on, the, the heater doesn't come on, the air conditioner doesn't come on, so we need material blessings. But that's not, that's not the end all and be all of our life. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, according to his will. Now, who is we? We as faithful Christians. We are the, the we is the ones that are seeking Christ and his will. And when we ask according to his will, we ask th for things that are in harmony with his will. He's going to bless us with them. Now, he may bless us with a can of beans. But when you're hungry, I'm going to tell you, peanut butter and crackers works out pretty good. Now, if I'm sitting there eating the last of my peanut butter and crackers, and Charles comes along and says, man, I'm hungry. Well, you're going to get some peanut butter and crackers. Well, I don't really like peanut butter and crackers, and you're, you're going to be hungrier still, because that's what I got. If you want... There's, there's the knife, and there's the jar, and there's the crackers. So we share what we have, and that's what we do. And as we do, as we go along, I, and I tell you what, just kind of my own opinion on this thing, if God finds a heart that is generous, I think he's going to make sure that that heart has a whole lot more to be generous with. Again, just an observation of my own, and you think about it as you will. But seeking God first is not just the best policy. Have you ever, you've ever heard, well, honesty is the best policy. No, that's not true. It's the only policy. Because anything less than honesty is dishonesty. So honesty is not just the best, it's the only policy. Now, I don't understand what people mean by it, but you need to be more accurate in it. But seeking God first is, uh, is not just the best policy, it is the only rational one. In Acts chapter 11, in verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. It's the idea of, of sticking with him through thick and thin, and not, not, not falling by the wayside because things get tough. You see that in marriages today. You know, when, 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 when hard times come, 
couples split up. I, I've heard of couples when a child dies that they just, they just break up at the time you need your spouse the most. I, I just, man, it's, well, I wish. But anyways, a whole other operation. Um, 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But as we discussed in Bible class this morning, having that prayer answered, being able to ask that prayer and having it answered is the fact that we're faithful in the first place, that we're children of God and faithful children of God. Now, an unfaithful child of God can see the light and come back to it and have his sins forgiven, but it's based upon true repentance and seeking what God wants us to do. And finally, we should never worry about tomorrow. Now, I, I, I wished I had the answer to this one. <laughs> this, is, this is a toughie. Um, I've told you the story. I was going to school of preaching. A bunch of us, we've been studying about the providential hand of God in class. It had come up in discussion. And we're having our coffee break, and uh, Charlie Davis, good man, good man, love that man. He, anyway, he's sitting here. He's, got his, he's, he's drinking tea. And he's got his cup of hot water and he's dumping his tea bag in there. And he said, you know, I don't, I don't believe in insurance. I'm letting the Lord take care of me. I said, Brother, Brother Davis, I said, I said uh, how do you know that having insurance isn't God's providential care? I never thought about that. <laughs> Good thing you showed up today, that, didn't it? <laughs> but, you know, we never know. We just, we just never know. Uh, we have to think about these things, but worrying about our planning insurance, you plan for tomorrow. You have health insurance. You have, you have car insurance. You have fire insurance on your house. Um, uh, you, you have investments for retirement. If you have just a 401k and you decide to have something else, you know, bless your heart. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, have, have resources. That's, that's one reason why they're there. Paul says uh, in Acts 14, 17, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and then he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with uh, food and gladness. Ephesians 4, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that which is honest, that, that thing which is good that he may have to give to him that, that needeth. And James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We need to appreciate the blessings that God has given us. You know, I, I, I have to think that, you know, even though Jerry's passed away, I, man, I had 46 years with that woman. Bless her, bless her heart, you know. But I, I, I had a good life. I've got a good life. I have, no, I have, if, I tell, people say, how you doing? I said, if I said anything, I'd just be complaining. I'm doing well. I'm sad. I'm doing well. But, you know, uh, we've been truly blessed. I have, I have nothing to complain about. So, you know, all of these things and the fact that I'll see her again, that's, that's an investment. You know, living the faithful Christian life. So you'll, see, so you'll see your faithful brothers and sisters in Christ and your faithful family members again. I've told you this before. Ira North used to be the editor for the Gospel Advocate years ago and was the minister for the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. He said he pictured the, basically the bosom of Abraham as, as, as a train platform. And every time a new soul came... There'd be people standing there waiting on it. How's everything back home? You know, how's, how's mom and dad? How are the kids doing? You know, to get that report, how's the congregation back in wherever? How's things going back there? To get that report, now, I don't know. I, that's just the way he thought about it. I thought that was interesting because I, sure enough, if I was there first and, and some, one of y'all came along, how's Jerry doing? You know, I'd be asking that question for sure. If we truly recognize that true treasure exists in the eternal home in heaven, then our lives here will truly change for the better. Because if I, I don't want to say I truly understand heaven, because I don't know how you do, but you can get a grasp of the blessings of being there. What little I know about heaven and what little I know about hell, I know where I want to go. I know what I want to avoid. And so my life, as best I can, is to gear that thing towards living the righteous life so that when Christ comes again or I pass away, whichever one comes first, I'm going to be good. I'll be all right. And that's, that's the goal of all this. That's the purpose for whatever life we have. However, you know, you go down to the graveyard and 
And you see gravestones of a, of a child that lived literally just, just hours or maybe days or weeks. And you see, you see old people that, that you, they were so old, they, they, yeah, watch out, watch out. I was just told to watch out. But, but you, see, you see gravestones of people that were old when they died. They weren't just old, they were old when they died. And, and, and you, you look at that and you think, man, it's just, just we have this time to prepare for later on. So whatever time we have, we need to be prepared. And I don't care when you obeyed the gospel, going forward is a whole new operation. And the life needs to be lived in such a way that when Christ comes again or you pass away, it'll work out well for you. When we grasp the truth that for Jesus to be the author of our eternal salvation requires our obedience and we truly value our soul. How valuable are you to yourself? What, what, what do you mean to you? And then put that in context of where you will spend eternity. If you value yourself, if you truly value yourself, not just give mouth service to it, then you're going to live the faithful Christian life to go to heaven because that's the best thing for your soul. I don't like pain. You know, no pain, no gain. I think no pain, no pain. Okay, that's the way I look at it. I don't want to go to eternal damnation. Farthest thing from my mind. Then it becomes easier and easier to submit. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, He is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey Him. Mark 8 and verse 37, What shall a man give, give in exchange for his soul? Because every moment of every day that you live apart from the Lord, you are taking this material universe and all the works that are therein that are going to be burned up on the day of judgment, that's what you're giving your soul for. And on the day of judgment, all this will be gone. You take Bill Gates and all the rest of that billionaire crowd and you stack up all their stuff in the middle aisle. On the day of judgment, poof, it's going to be gone. And then what? And Bill Gates has said he doesn't have time for God, doesn't have time for religion. I mean, that's the account that I read. That's, somebody asked him and he said, I don't have time for that. It'll be too late. It'll be too late. Oh, if only. I wish I had a. I should have, could have. All that stuff will be said. So right now, how are you? And that's for you to answer. Are you in the Lord or out? And there's no third possibility. Now, that's either I'm in or I'm out, or I'm just not really sure. Well, then let's talk about that. Let's open up our Bibles, and we'll, you know, you ask questions, we'll open up our Bibles, and we'll get the answers. We'll get an answer. We'll get the answer for you. And what you do with it at that point is up to you. If you're not a child of God, become one. But believing that Jesus is Christ after having been taught, John 6, 44 and 45, and then believing, John 8 and verse 24, Jesus says, uh, being willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, confess him before men. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus says, be baptized for mischief sins, Mark 16, 16, live that faithful Christian life, Jesus said, Revelation 2 and verse 10. And you'll be okay. If you've done those things, but you've been unfaithful, come back. If you need our prayers, let us pray for you. Again, questions, let's sit down and study them. And we'll both come away as better people for it. But if you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come. All together we stand.